Henry Ford once stated that build a good product trying to serve the public and you know, deliver what's needed. If you start a business thinking only of dollars, you're most likely doomed for failure. But if you're trying to build a good product, keeping your costs in line, he said, you're destined for success. Well, if your definition of an entrepreneur is one that takes an idea or a concept and uh, a little bit of capital and a lot of hard work, uh, it's really unique that we have three examples of that all from the same family. There's Herb Rupp, who was partner with my grandfather in Gorman Rupp, Mick Rupp with Rupp Industries, Rupp Marine, and probably a few others I don't even know about. And, and Warren Rupp with Warren Rupp Industries, uh, all right here in Mansfield. Back in 1932, uh, my dad, I call him Herb, had the idea of the self-priming surgical pump and uh, didn't have any money. Uh, and ran into J.C. Gorman on the street corner in Mansfield. And the partnership was formed. I remember one night working at Gorman Rupp with, with Jim Gorman because he and I used to have a business together making uh, fender pads for Lincoln Continentals. And we were remarking, Mick at that point was working out of one corner of Gorman Rupp's plant. And then he got so big he had to have his own factory. And Warren, of course, was an entrepreneur, built, built his business up from scratch. They all had that entrepreneurial drive and entrepreneurial spirit that made them and their companies successful. We learned more from our dad about basic engineering or just basic thoughts uh, than we did in school. And uh, he was a tough old German. If you did something or made something, he would ask, is, is that the best you could do? If you said no, he had a vein right in the middle of his forehead. It would pop out and he would be totally upset. Why you waste your time if you're not doing the best you can? It will give you pride, It'll give you self-confidence, always trying to do your best. And I found that to be totally true. It wasn't for the things we learned from our dad. And, you know, the example of the Gorn Rep Company gave us, you know, the uh, outlook and attitude to go out and, you know, try things on our own. I was a go-kart dealer for uh, the go-kart company of California uh, the summer of 58. Uh, uh, got laid off, and my dad would stop over after I had been laid off and want to know if I had a job. And um, I said, well, no, not right now. He would refuse to talk to me. Did not, he, he and mother would come over to see the kids and he wouldn't talk to me if I didn't have a job. So I put together a go-kart with what I call a step frame. Well, I took it out to uh, the Johnny Appleseed Shopping Center uh, before it was you know, amounted very much, and there was four light posts that we used to race around out there. On New Year's Day, a bunch of us took our carts out there, and lo and behold, with a step frame, uh, beat everybody with the same type of engine. So I had the idea that my mate, well, by the end of the day, had orders for three of them. A fellow by the name of Reggie Moxley from Toledo, Ohio, had called and said, I heard about the uh, carts you're making, and he wanted to order five of them. Well, about the time my dad stopped over, dad and mother stopped over the next time, that I had orders for 26 of them. So that's basically how we started out in the, in the go-kart business. Doc Taw stopped in, and uh, he had a uh, Beechcraft Bonanza with a large baggage door. And he wanted to know if we could put together a little scooter of some kind and fold the handlebars down that he could put in the back of that Bonanza. So we came up with the idea of this you know, little mini bike and uh, we, rather than just build one, built two of them. One, of course, for Doc Taws, and uh, the second one uh, played with a little bit. And the spring of the year, they're having a race down mid-Ohio. So I took it down to mid-Ohio, and the uh, race was going on, and drove around the pits with it, and a lot of people in the pits said, we would like to have a mini bike. So, click, we'll go into mini bike production, because we had all the small wheels and the, uh, both three and a half horse engines to uh, put mini bikes together. And that's how the mini bikes you know, started. The mini bike business grew to the point where uh, in 1971, we built around 75,000 mini bikes that year.
He started with making go-karts and mini bikes and wasn't satisfied with that. Uh, wanted to have some fun, he said, so he um, began uh, designing and uh, uh, building and eventually manufacturing a snowmobile. And he was jumping in there with the big guys, uh, Bombardier with their Ski-Doo and uh, John Deere had a uh, snowmobile. It was uh, an emerging market, but still pretty crowded. But boy, it didn't deter him. We had the, the, the first all in snowmobile chassis. And that was a real education. Uh, we learned a lot on forgings, extrusions. It's sort of willing to take a chance, try something outside the box, uh, don't listen to all of the people that tell you that it won't work. I decided to make an outrigger for myself to put on the boat because I didn't, you know, like what was on the market. Put the outrigger on our boat and different people saw it and said, well, we'd like to have an outrigger like that. And I said, oh my gosh, it'd be terrific. I could make a few outriggers and let Uncle Sam pay for the trips back and forth. I could write the boat off for testing and as a sales tool and demonstration. It could be a you know, a tax benefit. Well, the outrigger business just took off. He was, he was willing to take a suggestion and build on it. Um, the last business he's built, the deep sea fishing tackle business. I mean, whoever would have thought somebody who tinkered with dart carts and mini bikes and three wheelers and snowmobiles was then all of a sudden switch tacks and now build fishing tackle. Uh, I think at one time he was talking about going into actually building the boats themselves, but I think he backed off on that stunt. So he's a man of many talents. If your bucket list includes racing in the Indianapolis 500 and racing a P-51 Mustang at 500 miles an hour at the Reno Air Races, Mick's already got you beat. My sister had married Chas Watson, the brother of A.J. Watson that built the uh, Indianapolis Roadsters and had uh, won out in the how many times the Indianapolis 500. I had me going through Indianapolis one day and he was out at the track with uh, their sprint car that A.J. Foyt drove. A.J. wasn't there, but they're out just warming up, you know, warming the car up and stuff like that and asked me if I'd like to take a ride in the uh, sprint car. I, well, of course I'd like to take a ride. Well, I was only a couple tenths of a second off the, you know, the track record in a sprint car because it felt like just a big, powerful go-kart. And that really got me hooked. He decided one time he wanted to race in Indianapolis races. So he went out and bought a cart for, and ended up, I think, fifth or sixth in his first race. That was it. He did it. He's always thinking ahead of the curve. And uh, the kind of people that he associated with are those um, extreme motorsports type people that require thinking ahead of the curve. With the flying and the airplanes, uh, I met really interesting people. Uh, Bob Hoover, who I think was probably the greatest stick and rudder guy that uh, ever came down the pike. Uh, and then Bud Anderson, Chuck Yeager, and those guys. We sailed at the Clear Fork Reservoir, a group of us did, and we were commenting about it was going to be a drifting race the next morning, Sunday morning, because it looked like no wind. And Mickey piped up and said, well, I think I can take care of that for you. So along about 10 o'clock in the morning, we were starting to race, and it was drifting. Nobody was moving. And all of a sudden, we heard a roar in the distance. And along came a P-51 Mustang about 100 foot above Clear Fork Reservoir and buzzed the whole thing. We ran into Mickey a couple of weeks later at another party. And his comment was, he said, I tried to give you wind, but it only lasted about five seconds. And I said, well, what little bit you did do caused us to bounce around a bit, but we could have used about 20 or 30 more passes. And I'm sure the FAA is still looking for that plane today as to what happened. There were, I guess there were a number of complaints made by the people around there as to somebody trying to create havoc on the lake. We participated in mid-Ohio go-kart races. And I didn't drive, but I was a support factor. And we were going down the track between races, inspecting the track for loose nuts and bolts and mufflers or what else might have fell, fallen off a go-kart. And here's a P-51. And I take my hat off and I'm in the middle of the runway and, or driveway and roadway, and I'm waving my hat like this. And he pulled the wing up like this, come right down 
And when he went over the top of me, he wasn't any higher than this building above me. And every pulse of every piston I could feel shake my body. And he'd pull the wing up then right over the announcer stand. And he was not very high above that announcer stand. I sure it cured their constipation. Five years ago, I sold the business to my son and son-in-law and uh, moved back to Mansfield. I asked him, you know, why did he decide to sell? Because once you do that, the entrepreneurship stops. And he told me the story of when he and a couple other snowmobile people went to Japan and went through a couple of the factories over there. They molded their parts, they made their parts, they assembled them with robots and welders. And he came back and said, you realized that at that point, the Japanese had us beat, not by brain power, but by uh, innovations in assembly. So that was sort of the end, and that's what sort of happened to a, a number of the American industries. Having the 40 acres, having my wife Jeannie, our four dogs, uh, life is good. You know, doing the very simple things in life. Uh, I go down to Florida and the boys down there say, Hey Pops, we've got a little problem with how about an engine? Hey, it's all used up. I'm not thinking, I'm not going to lay awake nights nice thinking about that. The other big thing is we uh, like to, we have a big tree spade to move trees. And we have brought in from Wade and Gatton 281 trees to put on the property. And uh, that is probably our number one enjoyment. He's the only one I know who's bought his own five ton truck to plant trees. When I looked at it out there, I said, my Lord, Mick, the, the nurseries around here don't have that kind of thing. There's, there's really no halfway with Mick. Uh, everything he does is, is first class, 100% uh, plus. My father used to call him the maestro. What is the maestro orchestrating today? And uh, over the years since I've known him, he's orchestrated three companies that I know of and built them from scratch. And he's a multi-talented guy. And he doesn't let any grass grow under his feet. He's always tinkering and doing something. Don't let you know, fear be a deterrent you know, of trying to do something. Uh, uh, do, do not have fear of failure. It didn't work. It's like, you know, hey, you get thrown on the ground, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and charge again.